Hi, everybody. It's Peter Schiff. It's Monday, August 30th, uh, 2010. I'm here in the studio again waiting to do an hour uh, segment on CBC Fast Money. Anyway, this is the last day of the month. Uh, apparently, this is one of the worst Augusts uh, ever uh, for the stock market as far as uh, performance. You know, one interesting uh, aspect of the month, you know, today you have many of the financials, uh, brokerage firms, banks hitting new 52-week lows, while you have many of the gold stocks hitting new 52-week highs. And, of course, these are, two, this, these are very connected because the government bailed out all the banks and all these financials. And because they had to print so much money to bail them out, that's why the gold stocks are doing so well. But as I said, when the government was bailing these companies out, that investors should stay away from them, that you know, they're great places to work because if you work at a financial, you can make a lot of money. Uh, but they, they make a lot of risky bets, and when the bets go bad, the bailouts wipe out the shareholders. Uh, so at the time, I was telling people not to invest uh, in, in financials, even though they got pretty cheap uh, from a trading perspective. I think for people who wanted to trade money, it was much better to trade the mining stocks because at least they were legitimate businesses. But, of course, now these stocks are really rolling over, and people who are playing in this sector are getting burned. You know, I try not to give... Uh, advice on how to speculate. I give investment advice, and I don't think buying a, a basically insolvent company just because it might rally, that's, you know, a speculator can do that, but an investor needs to stay away. You need to look at companies where they have sound fundamentals, uh, and the gold stocks fundamentals are much sounder, and I think that's why they're still rising while these financials are, are going down. You know, oil uh, was down about $3 today, even though gold prices were up $10, and I think what's happening is uh, traders are starting to look at the U.S. slowdown and factoring this uh, a global recession as if the world is going to follow our lead the way we did in 2008. Again, I don't think that's going to happen. I think the global recovery is real. The U.S. recovery is an illusion. I think we will decouple. We Maybe we didn't do it in 2008, but I think we're doing it now. And I think as traders start to appreciate the strength of the data that's still coming out of Asia and Europe, uh, that you're going to see a turnaround in, in, in oil and other commodities, although the agricultural commodities have been strong, like gold. It's just that oil has been the exception. Um, you know, we got a lot of economic data that came out. Uh, yesterday we got uh, personal spending data, again, which was weaker than expected uh, because incomes uh, rose only slightly, but spending rose by more. I think income was up two-tenths and spending was up four-tenths, so our savings rate dropped to 5.9% going the wrong way. Remember, we need to replenish our savings. The fact that Americans are spending more money by going into debt is only making the problem worse. You know, also I noticed Laura Tyson, I don't know if you saw, I debated her on, um, on the BBC last week, but she had an op-ed. I, I don't know if, it, if she wrote it before or after our debate, uh, but in her op-ed, Laura Tyson argued that we need a second stimulus. Now, first of all, it wouldn't be a second stimulus. It would be the fourth stimulus of this recession. The first two stimuluses happened under Bush. First, there were the stimulus checks. Then there was the TARP bailout. Then when Obama got elected, he had his $800 billion stimulus. So if we have another stimulus, it's not the second stimulus of this recession. It's the fourth stimulus. And it's not going to work any better than the last three. And in fact, there were more stimuluses in Bush's first term, right, which is what gave us uh, the housing bubble. You know, also, I think yesterday, uh, President Obama came out and gave a short uh, speech about his new jobs bill. And he says that, you know, his jobs bill, the problem is he says that small businesses can't get credit. And so he has a bill to help them get credit. And he wants to lower their taxes with these targeted tax cuts. Well, what Obama doesn't understand is the reason small businesses can't get credit is because his administration is running huge deficits. The credit isn't there. The government is borrowing it. And if the government isn't borrowing it, the government is guaranteeing a, a, a mortgage. You know, if someone's out there refinancing their mortgage, where's that money coming from? I mean, if it, the, the money is, is the money that's not being loaned to small business. So there is no magic uh, bullet. They can't pass a law to create credit. Credit has to come from savings. The way to get credit is for the government to cut spending you know, or to allow interest rates to rise. But that's not going to happen. And of course, the taxes that are here, I mean, he's talking about tax cuts. There are tax hikes. And it's not just the actual taxes, but the cost of compliance 
with all these new government rules and regulations that the Obama administration is passing, that increases the cost of business. And it's not just small businesses that are being affected. It's all businesses are being affected by the higher cost of complying with government regulations. So he's making a speech about what small business needs. What we need is for, is for Obama and the government to get out of the way. We need Congress to lower or re repeal regulations, to cut taxes, but to do that in a meaningful way, they need to cut government spending. Because if they just borrow the difference, then there is no credit. All we have is inflation and we have a, a, uh, a worse economy. You know, speaking about uh, bad econ economic ideas, you know, I happened to be driving in my car the other day and I was listening to CNBC on the radio. So I couldn't see. So I didn't really know who was talking. And I was listening to this guy and I was hearing him say one crazy thing after another. And I was thinking to myself, who is this guy? I mean, this is some of the mo most nonsensical stuff I've ever heard anybody say on CNBC. And of course, at the end of it, uh, they said, well, I'd like to thank uh, Paul Krugman from the, you know, for, I, I, you know, and this is probably some of the worst stuff I've seen Krugman say. I mean, he was talking to the host of the show about the stimulus and the host actually mentioned that he was talking to somebody who lived in an area that got stimulus money and that they were repaving roads that were in good shape and didn't need to re be repaved. And I commented on the same thing here in Connecticut. We're repaving the Merritt Parkway. It was in great shape. And not only are we wasting resources to repave roads that don't need it, but we're creating traffic jams unnecessarily. And what Paul Krugman actually said uh, on this on television was, well, it doesn't matter if the roads need it or not. The important thing is that we do it and we put people to work. I mean, I'm not making this up. And then he actually said, at this point in time, things are so bad that it makes sense to pay people to dig ditches. Now, of course, what he also means is you pay some people to dig ditches and you pay other people to fill them back up again. Now, what a waste of resources. See, now Paul Krugman says, well, it's not a waste because they're, they're, they're just unemployed. It's not like we're, we're taking them away from something that's more productive. Well, first of all, why pay them the big dig ditches? Why not just you know, pay them to do nothing? I mean, because society gets no benefit from digging ditches that are going to be refilled. But what Paul Krugman is not asking, the question he's not asking is, why are these people not working? It's not because there's, you know, they, there's no demand. I mean, there are plenty of things that Americans want that they don't have. It's not a question of not having demand. It's not having the ability to create the supply to satisfy that demand. And if there's somebody who's unemployed, that, that, that labor resource is idle for a reason. It's because the government has created obstacles and impediments that are preventing that person from being employed. So why don't we figure out what those obstacles and impediments are and remove them? Let's not just create some unproductive government job because after all, we don't want jobs because we want work. We want what we produce as a result of that labor. And if we just put people to, to, to work, digging ditches and filling them back up again, we gain absolutely nothing as a result of that labor. And, you know, I saw, uh, uh, what's his name, Robert Reich make the same uh, comment last night on, on Kudlow when he was saying that there's no crowding out, that any money the government spends is not crowding out any private sector spending because it's all idle, because it's just sitting there. That is nonsense. Whatever money the government spends, whatever resources it removes, it's removing them from the private sector. And the fact that government policy is preventing these resources from being efficiently uh, utilized isn't, a, isn't an excuse to come up with some other government program. All this is doing is getting in the way of a badly needed restructuring of our economy. But rather than letting the economy restructure so that people can work productively, the government wants to keep them employed unproductively to preserve this illusion. But as a result, we're not going to have anything to show for all of our efforts. And even though we're going to be working, we're, going to, we're not going to be enjoying the fruits of our labor because we're not going to be productive. And we're simply going to destroy our economy. Now, also, I... I there was the, uh, an op-ed in the Washington Post, I think that ran either Friday or Monday, kind of validating what I was saying about unemployment. And the, the author argued that it was the extension of unemployment benefits that were the reason that the unemployment rate was still so high. And he argued that had we not extended the benefits, he thought the unemployment rate would be under 7% right now. And because we extended them so many times, creating such a powerful incentive for people not to work, uh, that it's even higher. And of course, that incentive is going to get even bigger the longer we extend these benefits. And of course, now when you throw in the benefits where if you're unemployed, uh, the government's going to pay your mortgage, they're going to pay your property taxes, they're going to pay your maintenance. Uh, we're making it more and more, more and more uh, attractive for people not to seek employment opportunities. At the same time, we're destroying the legitimate employment opportunities that exist with high regulations, high taxes, 
and by destroying the availability of credit because the government is either borrowing it all itself or guaranteeing consumer debt or mortgage debt so that businesses can't get credit. Anyway, that's it for today. Take care, everybody.